Hi all, thank you for coming out today. Um, my name's Ian Beamish. Uh, I'm uh, an assistant professor in the UL History Department. Um, and this is our fifth week now of our Archives in Crisis series, um, which is made possible by the Louisiana Board of Regents and the Gilbo Charitable Trust. Uh, we hope in the future you'll be able to join us for some of our three remaining uh, weeks. Uh, Preston Huff will be here in two weeks talking about disaster response, followed by Aaron Cowan on grant writing for smaller institutions, and Stephen Sloan finally wrapping up the series talking about oral history. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to briefly thank uh, Liz Skilton and Marissa Petru, uh, the co-directors of the Gilbo Center that is uh, organizing um, this series, as well as our graduate student, Sabar Abukamra, who couldn't be here, and Julia Fontenot. Uh, if you do need Wi-Fi and you haven't been to one of the talks here before, uh, the network is Light Public Wireless, and the password is lights at light, L-I-G-T-S, at symbol, L-I-T-E. Uh, and if you want to look at any of our other series, uh, they've all been recorded uh, by the folks here at AOC uh, and are available on YouTube uh, via their channel or our social media, uh, UL Public History, um, on Twitter, Facebook, and so on. So with that, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Petru. Thank you, um, and welcome. Whoa. Okay. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for attending our event today. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, I'm here to just let you know that one of the projects that the Gilbo Center for Public History is working on is developing land acknowledgement guidelines for the university, for cultural institutions, including museums, libraries, and archives um, in this region, as well as nationally. So what is the purpose of a land acknowledgement? Um, the purpose of a land acknowledgement is one, to acknowledge that uh, native communities have existed for millennia in this region, that there is a history of settler colonialism on this land, and to acknowledge that we are uninvited guests on stolen land. Um, to emphasize the continued thriving of these communities and to pay our respects. So we would like to pay our respects to the elders past, present, and future for stewarding the land on which this event is taking place um, and thank them for um, continuing to allow us to carry out this work. I would like to also express my gratitude to the numerous peoples from different native communities who have helped us as we are working on putting together these guidelines. So that includes Lenora Kiral of the United Homa Nation, Dr. Linda Langley of the Kushada Tribe, Nakai Northup of the Mashantucket Pequot, and Andana Spears of the Ojibwe and Diné Nations. And with that, I will turn it over to Julia. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Today our speaker is Melissa Easton. She graduated from LSU in 2008 with an MLIS focusing on archival science. She was hired the same year as the first archivist for the East Baton Rouge Parish Library System. And she is currently head of special collections overseeing the archives and genealogy collections for the organization. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How's the sound? Can you hear me? I'm usually pretty loud. <clears throat> all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Gilbo Center for inviting me to speak to you all today and commend them on hosting this wonderful series of talks. Um, again, my name is Melissa Easton. I'm head of special collections for the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. I received my MLIS from LSU with a focus on archival science. While I was working on my master's, I was hired by the State Library of Louisiana to work on a grant-funded project, IMLS grant-funded project, called the Louisiana Gumbo Project, which to date has digitized over 11,000 images from various state agencies, including the Department of Transportation and the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. 
They have also digitized a wonderful series of historic images from the Louisiana Library Association. If you've ever seen the image of the librarians uh, delivering books to houseboats by Piro, that's where that image came from. <coughs> I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of archives and community engagement. Oftentimes we think about crisis and archives as being an immediate event such as flood or fire. And while these issues are real and they must be addressed, we are also facing another type of crisis in our collections and that important historical materials often run the risk of being lost before they ever reach our safe and happy homes. There are many reasons that archival materials become lost to time, and there are many different ways in which to address these concerns. In our unique position as a public library archive, we are oftentimes at the front lines of saving these uh, collections from permanent loss. I'll start by giving you some background on our collection. Let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, the East Baton Rouge Parish Library started out, uh, uh, well, in order to give you a little bit of context and background about our system, um, the Joanna Waddell chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy established the first Baton Rouge Lending Library on the second floor of our firehouse, our, our first firehouse on 4th Street in downtown Baton Rouge. The East Baton Rouge Parish Library System was officially incorporated into the mu city's municipal structure in 1939 and opened their first branch that same year. This is our uh, first library branch. The building still stands. It's no longer part of the library system. Over the years, as library systems do, we expanded in locations and services we offer. The archives division was not established until 1980 when a civic-minded mayor uh, named Woody Dumas, that's him in the middle smiling with the glasses on, uh, was about to retire and he realized he didn't have any place to put his stuff. Um, about this time, he orchestrated the construction of a massive civic complex. If you've ever been to downtown Baton Rouge, most of that concrete was part of this project. Um, the River Center Branch Library, uh, the small building in the foreground, was part of that uh, construction effort. The Baton Rouge Room Archive began life as a one-room collection on the fourth floor of this library. It was established not only with Dumas' content, but with a large volume of materials, especially scrapbooks from women's social organizations in Baton Rouge. We also had a large collection of uh, the City of Baton Rouge municipal documents and some initial high-profile donations, like from the McElhenney family. Um, there were a number of reasons that this collection did not flourish in its location. Um, primarily, it seemed to me uh, that librarians and archivists have very different ways of dealing with content. Um, and the collection was staffed solely with uh, librarians. Um, I think the staff that was charged with dealing with the collection just became overwhelmed. I like to tell the story of when I was first considering taking this position, I went to check out the archives and the young woman uh, who was a library tech who didn't have a library degree, who was put in charge of this collection, walked me up into the room, walked through the door and literally started crying. She had no idea what to do with this stuff. I also think that people just weren't using the collection. They weren't aware of its existence. Um, Another huge roadblock to accessing this collection was that the city of Baton Rouge and its infinite wisdom provided no public parking. Uh, this factor combined with the perception uh, that the downtown Baton Rouge area, especially after the oil bust, was a dangerous no man's land had real and lasting uh, effects on the door count of this branch. In 1986, uh, the citizens of East Baton Rouge Parish voted, voted to fund the library with a dedicated parish-wide tax. Since then, our voters have consistently supported the library's mission over the past 30 years by overwhelmingly approving the renewal of our library tax. This is an original button from our original campaign from the library's archives. <clears throat> um, as a public library archive, our survival depends not only on the community's fi financial support, but their trust and understanding of our purpose. 
And I do have to say, I recognize how fortunate we are in our library system to be so well funded. And I understand that many other collecting institutions face the daily burden of underfunding. As public li library interests and archives began to grow in the early 2000s, our administration planned to begin to revive the collection. Uh, the library hired a consultant, I think some of you know her, Faye Phillips, she's pretty active in the archives world. She evaluated the contents of the collection and, and conducted a study on the feasibility of the system's capability to support an archives department. And after several years, a plan of action was developed and the system hired me as their first archivist in 2008. Um, when I took over the collection, what I found was that original order and much of the evidence of provenance was long gone. This collection basically was sitting idle or being mishandled for 30 plus years. Uh, collections have been disassembled into topical files uh, and you would find content from different collections put into boxes with subject headings on them. And there was no indication of from what collections these uh, materials came from, how they came into the library's possession. They were randomly stacked and dirty, dirty, dirty. Uh, there were no finding aids, few accession records, and no donation agreements. I spent the first year of my employment just trying to figure out what we had, where it was, and how it got so dirty. Once I accomplished these initial goals, it was time to devise a policy that would guide us into the future. The mission of the Baton Rouge Room Archives of the East Baton Rouge Parish Library is to collect, manage, preserve, and provide access to items that represent his significant historical actions of local gov governments, businesses, residents, and institutions of the city of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. These items include, but are not limited to photographs, manuscripts, documents, periodical publications, audio tapes, and memorabilia. Note in our mission statement that we focus on materials from the city of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. We adhere pretty closely to this geographical limiter. The main reason for this is that we are fortunate to be in a town with some fantastic collecting institutions. We've got LSU's Hill Memorial Library. We've got the State Archives. We've got the State Library. And we also have the Baton Rouge Catholic Diocese Archives. Um, it's important for space con conservation that I don't duplicate uh, items in these collections. It also makes life easier in our archival community that we're not in competition for content, though that sometimes does happen for the really good stuff. Um, so with the physical collection finally in hand after several years, we move from our out-of-date downtown branch to the newly constructed main branch. If you have not been to this facility, it is worth the trip. It is amazing. Our, our administration did a really fantastic job. Uh, we are located in the central part of the parish. Uh, the move also incorporated the library's genealogy department, our microfilm collection, and vertical files into what I like to call a one-stop shop for local historical and genealogical research. I went from a one-person, one-room collection to a 13,000 square, square foot facility equipped with key card entry, a backup generator, a fire suppression system, and a staff of 10. It was quite the adjustment. With the move to a more central and accessible location, the public's library, the public's awareness of our department began to increase. We also began to experience more foot traffic with the rise in popularity of genealogy. I think genealogy is in the top three uh, pastimes for uh, people in the United States right now. Now that our department was well staffed, we had time to discuss with our patrons what was in our department, what it contained, and what exactly it is we do. Donors who had given their collection to the library decades ago now had the ability to access their content for the first time in years. Through these conversations, we began to see a pattern in the community. Our visitors often expressed the sentiment that they had no idea that the library held such a collection. We were hearing the phrase, wow, you keep that kind of stuff a lot. Uh, many people in, uh, 
groups and organizations who had a material, oh, okay, many people, groups and organizations have collections and many of them just don't know what to do with them. It became obvious that it was time to begin a campaign of education and inform our library users about not only the mere existence of the department and what it contained, but also ways in which we could help them care for their personal and organizational collections. This uncertainty of what to do with archival materials makes these collections very vulnerable to loss, whether it be to garbage or dissemination in thrift stores. We have found, also found that some collectors are unwilling to relinquish their archives to repositories, sometimes out of love, sometimes out of the desire for perceived financial gain. Have a lot of times I have people walk into the door with items that they want to value on and they just don't have any value to anybody but collecting institutions and, and we don't have a lot of money to buy these things. Um, so they sell them for cheap to estate sales or thrift stores. They have thrift stores separate them out and provenance and original order are lost and thus the informational value of these collections. Oftentimes, people who inherit collections are overwhelmed and it's easier to throw to what archivists are valuable collections away. A great example of this is the Willie Harris collection. Harris was a police officer at Southern University in the 1960s and 70s and he was also an avid photographer. When he died in 1994, he left behind a collection of over 40,000 eight by 10 black and white prints of photographs from Southern University and the surrounding African American communities. <clears throat> Someone from his estate made the decision to trash the collection, literally throwing it away. Um, fortunately, a local photographer and member of the community where uh, Harris lived, James Terry, got wind of the dump and saved the items from permanent loss, literally gathering the materials up off the street curb. A large selection of these uh, extremely important photographs are now safely housed in our Scotlandville branch in our African American collection. And you can also view a sampling of these images on our digital archive. In the course of my career, fueled by some weird obsession to save as much historical evidence as I can, I've been in more garbage cans and dumpsters than I care to admit. I've also been in abandoned houses. I'm a regular at garage and estate sales and the workers at most of the local thrift and antique stores know me by name. I give you all of this background to help put into context our undertaking within our community. It soon became an intrinsic though unspoken part of the mission of our department to raise community awareness of the importance of caring for personal collections as well as helping people understand the value these materials have to the collective memory of our community and ways in which they can access them. Incorporating a campaign to raise awareness of the importance of personal, organizational, and business archives into our mission did not present itself as an easy task. We began by taking a multifaceted approach to raising the public's awareness of the value of archives their functions, and the different ways these types of collections can be accessed and used. Our community outreach program has developed somewhat organically with aspects of deliberateness, and it's comprised of three distinct approaches, education, outreach, and access. As more and more people came into our department saying, I have no idea what to do with all of this stuff, we began to consult them. Many times the person sitting across the table from me was a longtime member of a social organization like the Baton Rouge Music Club or the Junior League. Some of these groups had decades upon decades of records living in garages, attics, and extra bedrooms. I mean, I admire these people for holding on to the materials in such a dedicated way, but they were getting tired of this stuff. Um, the membership of many of these groups is aging and the desire to deal with 40, 50, 60 years or more of content was not how they envisioned spending their retirements. Initially, my general response to these meetings was automatically, well, I'll take it. Um, but after a couple of years of having completely unorganized collections walking in the door, I realized there had to be a better way. I developed a donation pamphlet to inform, uh, 
to people who we were, explain what the scope of the collections are, what we will and will not accept, etc. Uh, we also, uh, in this pamphlet, include the offer of helping people find homes for collections that do not fit our collection development policy. Um, we also began counseling potential donors on basic organization condi and condition requirements. After several bug and mold infested collections walked in the door, it became a, an important part of the talk. Um, it also became apparent that there are groups and organizations that want to maintain custody of their items, that they don't want to deposit it in an archives, but they don't have the resources or the time or the knowledge uh, to put their collections in a type of order that could potentially be vital to their long-term survival. As word of mouth is spread, we have more and more small organizations coming in for advice in the care and management of their collections. The approach we now take with these groups is to offer free consultations on the organization and care of archival materials. I also often provide starter packages con consisting of archival storage like boxes, folders, a handful of um, photographs, sleeves, both 8x10 and 5x7, um, and a list of resources and of course an offer to accept materials on permanent uh, deposit, if, of course, if they fit our collection development policy. The idea behind this concept is to sort of front load collecting, if you will. If we can get organizations and individuals to even moderately organize their materials before donating them, it's not only easier for us, it's better for the collection. Oftentimes, when a completely disorganized set of materials comes in, it's very time consuming for our processing archivist to what I call impose order on a collection. Um, there's no original order. There's no concept of original order. A lot of times you don't have any bylaws or establishing documents for these collections. So really you're just guessing and imposing order is very subjective. Um, and it's, always, it's not always the best way to go. With minimal preparations, getting our donors to discard multiple duplicates, we do not need 15 copies of the same newsletter, or sorting records just into basic categories, whether it be financial records, meeting minutes, et cetera, or uh, chronologically, uh, we find a collection will arrive to us much healthier, easier to process, and thus available to researchers more quickly. I would like to insert here that if a collection meets our criteria and is in a state that does not put our other collections at risk, I will absolutely accept it in a disordered state. Pre-organization of materials is no means a requirement for donation, it is simply line out. Also, if an organization takes the time to establish an archival program, we as a community are much less likely to lose these valuable materials. The other side of that coin is that when people are aware that their content has value, it is more likely to be protected and survive into the future, potentially ending up into a collecting institution and made available for use and research. Another obstacle we face in protecting collections is teaching people not to be intimidated by the concept of an archive. In 2016, myself and my digital archivist, Emily Ward, organized a panel discussion at the annual meeting of the Society of American Archivists that focused on the crossover between research in genealogical and archival collections. One of the aspects we focused on was how familiar researchers were with the use of archival collections. One of the, um, I just said that. Um, in order to measure the rate in which researchers were using archival materials, we created a simple survey asking how long researchers had been working, whether or not they had ever used archival collections in the course of their research, and why or why had they not accessed information in an archive. About 65% of the respondents stated they had never used an archive in conjunction with their genealogical research. And the main reason they gave for this is that they weren't sure how to find out what archival collections contained, uh, what information, and they were unsure just basically how to go about accessing archival collections. This led us to our education campaign. Um, 
We developed a series of classes aimed at teaching the public how to access and use a wide variety of resources available at our library. You can see by our course catalog that we couch it um, more towards genealogical researchers. And this is mainly because these are the people that are walking in our door. Uh, we, 10 to 1, have more genealogical than archival researchers. So we definitely gear our program there. And once they find out about our archival education program, we, uh, we do get visitors uh, more from it. I actually did a dirty trick. Um, our, course, our courses, we have what is called uh, a certified East Baton Rouge Parish Library genealogist. So if you take 10 courses, you become a certified genealogist. We have a party with some cake and punch, and you get a little certificate. Eight of the classes can be genealogical, but two of them have to be archives. So if you want to be a genealogist, you have to be exposed to archives. Um, some of the archival classes that we teach, let's see if I can get there from here, um, are found on our info guide. And I'll talk about our info guide a little more. But first, we're going to talk about classes. Um, the main class uh, that I started with was called Preservation in the Home. In this workshop, we cover basic archival uh, concepts like temperature, humidity, and storage. Um, it's, it's a pretty interesting class. It really does uh, introduce uh, the public to um, very basic archival concepts that generally a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, we work to raise awareness of inherent vices that can destroy archival materials from the inside out. Um, we have on our uh, wonderful info guide this great little slideshow called the Hall of Horrors. Um, and these are our materials from our collection, uh, showing people the uh, potential uh, damage caused just by creating uh, a magnetic photo album. These are the worst. I wish they were never invented. This is adhesive ooze, uh, corroded 16 millimeter video. Uh, we also cover uh, digital um, archiving, and I'm gonna go more into that in a minute. These are corrupted files, etc. cetera. Uh, we also addre address how to prepare, plan, and prepare for long-term storage. This includes construction of scrapbooks, so we introduce the public to concepts of what exactly archivally safe material is. You can go to places like Michael's or Hobby Lobby, and they have aisles of this stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a wanderer. <laughs> uh, you can go to places like Michael's and Hobby Lobby and see our aisles of archivally safe material, but if you don't know how to read a label, you run the risk of purchasing materials that uh, can create more harm than good. Uh, we also cover management of digital contact, content, file format, file organization, et cetera, uh, migration of file formats, management of digital uh, photograph collections and disaster preparedness and recovery. Uh, this last topic is very important to us and I know you're gonna have a whole section on it, but living in Louisiana, it's necessary to be aware of the hazards of natural disasters. And we slant our dealings with water dam uh, towards dealing with water damages. This tends to be uh, the most uh, prevalent type of damage to personal collections we see. After the flood of uh, 2016 in Baton Rouge, it was months and months and months of helping people uh, try to recover what they could from, from their flood damaged materials, and we really learned a lot. Um, the Society of American Archivists has declared May as Preservation Month. They don't have their new graphics up. That's why it's 2018. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Preservation Month, uh, what, uh, this is, what we do is an annual blitz of preservation awareness activities during this time. Um, it's a time when archivists and other cultural heritage professionals take personal and professional responsibility for doing something simple. 
uh, something that can be accomplished in a day that can have a significant impact on an individual or repository's ability to respond. Uh, SAA has prepared a list of ideas, including a number of simple May Day activities that can help you respond to an emergency when and if it occurs. So if you haven't done so yet, you still have a few weeks, visit uh, the SAA website and maybe uh, plan some activities for next month. Uh, furthermore, we have incorporated personal digital archiving into our curriculum. Our personal digital archiving workshop helps collectors learn about long-term storage needs and strategies in managing these types of materials. Everyone, especially, especially children and teens from Generation Z, are creating digital content every day. This could be anything from sending or saving text messages, writing in a diary in Microsoft Word or a blog, or taking photo or video with a digital camera on, or a cell phone. This type of archival content is perhaps most vulnerable to loss, and it's important that our profession work to prevent what has become known as the digital dark age. The digital dark age is defined as a lack of historical information in the digital age as a direct result of outdated file formats, software, or hardware that becomes corrupt, scarce, or inaccessible as technologies evolve and data decays. As we have come to find out, the shelf life of born digital content is much shorter than that of analog materials, and stemming the loss of this content is not an easy task. If you've ever read any of the message boards or participated in any of the roundtables on these topics at SAA, uh, our, our profession is really facing a huge challenge. So all of you young students, uh, please help us. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of planning com and commitment to ensure uh, digital materials survive into the future. Last year, we were fortunate to be able to purchase a digital forensic station that allows us to manage a wide variety of obsolete born digital content. The FRED Tower, or Forensic Recovery of Evidence device, allows us to recover content from a wide variety of obsolete solid state and magnetic media. Um, it's been very interesting to see what comes in the door. We're starting to see now, especially in our collections that we're accessing, uh, accessing um, that were created uh, after 2000, more and more digital content that is already obsolete. Uh, pretty much the only thing we can't read with the Fred Tower, I don't know if y'all are young enough to, or old enough to remember those giant original floppy disks. That's pretty much the only format that we can't uh, access at this point. But if you see each of the portals on there is for a different type of content, the little toolbox has all the different interfaces so we can actually remove a hard drive from a laptop or a computer. We can image it and try to recover corrupt or lost files. It's been a very handy uh, tool to have in our collection. The second facet of our community awareness program is outreach. We're fortunate enough to have a number of arrows in our quiver to help uh, forward this part of our mission. Uh, one of the first things you may notice when you walk into our reading room are the seven dis display cases filled with items for our collection, from our collection. It's often a lot of, time, a lot of uh, work to create a comprehensive exhibit but we try to accomplish this on a six to eight week rotating basis. Each exhibit generally has a theme that relates to something going on in the community. For, so for example, our April May display fo focuses on Louisiana festivals and school libraries. April is school library month. We find people really relate to the local content and it's great to watch them come in and get excited to see things that they remember from their past in, ba in Baton Rouge. These exhibits have a twofold effect in that they inform our visitors of the wide variety of materials found in our collection and that they have actually sparked people to donate materials to us on several occasions. Along with our in-house promotional activities, we produce a monthly TV segment. I'm gonna play one for you real quick. Hello, my name is Emily Ward and I'm the digital archivist for the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. We are located in the Special Collections Department on the second floor of the main library at Goodwood, where Baton Rouge history comes alive. 
The mission of the Baton Rouge Room Archives of the East Baton Rouge Parish Library is to collect, manage, preserve, and provide access to items that represent significant historical actions of local governments, businesses, residents, and institutions of the city of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. These items include, but are not limited to, photographs, manuscripts, documents, periodical publications, audio tapes, and memorabilia. Most of the time, materials in our collections are housed in archival storage containers in our closed stack storage area. This area is restricted by security card access and equipped with a top-notch fire suppression system, as well as a backup generator in case of power loss. All of this can seem intimidating, and it does make it a little more difficult for patrons to access our historical materials. So the Staff and Special Collections organizes a monthly display that highlights materials from our collections that are generally hidden from public view. Each month we select a different theme, such as Black History Month, Mardi Gras, or spe specific historical events like the Battle of Baton Rouge to highlight in our display area and choose items that reflect how our community participated in that event. This month we are celebrating Baton Rouge Goes Back to School. As you look through our display cases, you will see a, a wide variety of materials from different collections in our care. For example, in this case, you will find items from our yearbook collection, our vertical files, our postcard collection, and our collection of Baton Rouge memorabilia. In other cases, you will find items from the Advocate Historical Archive, selections from our historical municipal documents, and even materials from our personal collection of one of our staff members. Here in Special Collections Department, we like to think of all of the little pictures that make up the big picture of history. Come to the Special Collections Department, located on the second floor of the main library at Goodwood, and enjoy all the little pictures that make up our back to school display. So we produce one of those a month. The topics vary. Again, it's usually kind of what is going on in that month. Um, another way that we try to increase outreach is uh, we have recently partnered with the Google Cultural Institute and we are now producing digital exhibits uh, which like our physical exhibits are created using content from our collection. This is the digital exhibit that we created for Black History Month and it addresses the uh, Baton Rouge swim-ins which were uh, 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 civic, uh, civil rights uh, protests in Baton Rouge that aimed and successfully desegregated our swimming pools. Um, it's a great way to present our materials in a historical context and also in a comprehensive format. I, oh, Ew, not Henry Watson. We're swinging wide here. Um, another facet of our educational program is our monthly lecture series. On the third Wednesday of each month, we host a speaker. The topics tend to be varied, but trend towards the in, uh, introducing our listeners to people working in the historical preservation and artistic fields in our region. Our most popular talks seem to be those about architecture and art. Uh, last month, we hosted a uh, folk artist, Henry Watson, who's been creating these wonderful bas-relief uh, wood carvings out of New Roads, Louisiana for 30 years. We even auctioned or uh, had a door prize where one of our uh, patrons won one of his uh, carvings. It was really fun. Um, we also uh, host or foster collections. Uh, we're currently fostering uh, several collections, among which are uh, the Louisiana Black History Hall of Fame collection and the Baton Rouge Fire Department collection. I love this picture. It's so metal. I can't stand it. Um, that's our fire chief and the assistant fire chief, and these dolls were deemed toxic, so they decided to set them on fire in a parking lot. Um, these two collections, the fire department and the Louisiana Black History Hall of Fame collection are kind of museums in waiting. They both came to us in moments of crisis. Each was suddenly forced to be removed from their storage areas and had no place else to go. Um, it, was, it was strange getting two frantic co phone calls in a period of six months like, you're the only one that can help us. It was very Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, so we ran over there, grabbed the stuff, threw it in, in our cars, and brought it back to our, our uh, library. Uh, we don't fully process materials because they're not ours on permanent deposit. We do, however, keep a full inventory and a file list for each. These museums may never come to fruition, but if they do, will we, return, we will return their materials from them. At least we know now this cultural property is safe. 
Finally, uh, another way uh, that we educate the public is the use of social media. Each week, our collection is featured as the Library Throwback Thursday post, of course, who else is gonna do it? Um, and I also frequently post content on pages like Old Images of Baton Rouge. I'm sure Lafayette has something similar. Uh, this platform gives the public yet an, uh, another avenue to engage co with content from our collection. And many times from these postings, we hear stories about the images that give more context to them. Um, the public has also helped us identify um, unidentified and misidentified objects. The next uh, aspect of our outreach program is access. Outside of uh, increasing physical access to the collection, over the years, like many archival collections, we've struggled with developing a comprehensive method of providing informational access. The main challenge has been how to prevent or present collections in a way that the public can easily interface. We initially started out with what is called an info guide. I mean, you see uh, info guides on many different library websites. They're really a very easy way to present a portal to your information, and this is ours. Uh, you can see here um, we have a lot of our basic content. We've got our upcoming events. We've got our digital archive. Um, down in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you can see our old inventories that were in spreadsheet format. This year, we've actually implemented archive space. Um, if you're not familiar with archive space, it's a web-based archive. Let me get this going. Uh, information management system designed by archivists and supported by diverse archival repositories. It's open source. So we spend time uh, working with archive space, uh, telling them uh, things that we need. Like yesterday, we found out that we don't have a tool to calculate our linear feet in our collection. We've got all, all of our uh, finding aids loaded into the collection, but for some reason there's no plug-in in archive space that allows us to calculate our linear square feet. So we called them up and we said, hey, we need this, and they were like, hey, that's a great idea, give us a few weeks and we'll develop the plug-in. So it's a very interactive system. We are in a hosted instance. You don't have to have a hosted instance. It is open source. If you have the skills uh, to manage a system, so far we recommend it. What I like about the archive space catalog is that it functions very much like a library catalog. So for example, you can type in a search term and everything in the collection that is tagged as our friend Woody Dumas comes up. So you see here we've got 346 separate instances of Woody Dumas in our collection. A really wonderful feature of this that, that expands uh, search results or expands uh, the ability uh, to find materials as subject headings. So when we upload our EADs, all of our tags uh, for subjects for each collection are automatically linked into different subject headings. So you can just click and it will bring you to other content in the collection that relates to your search topic. Uh, we just implemented this system a couple of months ago, so I don't have any real-time use statistics to give you. We are in the process of teaching workshops and publicizing this. So hopefully in the next six months, we'll have an idea of, of whether or not we made the right decision. Um, another way we provide access to our collection is loans. Many of our donors are still very active in the community. While we discourage individual donors from removing their materials, oftentimes we find our organizations like to check out their materials for different events or to celebrate milestones. Uh, this practice, which can at times be labor intensive and can work out well or work out not so well, um, has had the effect of encouraging donations. When uh, people see that their materials are not permanently relinquished and their content is accessible, they're much more likely to donate to us. Uh, one more popular service that we offer to the public is um, our scanners. 
We have three scanners available, a cradle book scanner, a large format map scanner, and 11 by 17 flatbed scanner. We promote the use of this hardware by offering scan days at least once a month and have steadily seen uh, patrons coming in and increasing their use of these devices. Helps people preserve their materials um, and they love it. They, they like uh, playing with our toys, which is fine with me. Finally, um, our most successful outreach effort has been our digital archive. Um, we are a content DM hosted instance um, and currently, uh, well, it's a virtual showcase that highlights m materials from our collection. To date, it holds over 7,000 separate images, documents, and audiovisual files. We currently have 27 separate chapters. Uh, each of these little boxes is considered a chapter uh, that represent different physical collections in our repository. The digital archive generates about 4,000 page views a month, and it also acts as a preservation tool, allowing us to reduce potentially damaging physical contact with our fragile archival material. Uh, we do have people that come into the collection and just want to start opening boxes, and of course we can't let that happen. So this is the way that we mitigate their sadness. We let them look at uh, digital files. Well, while we do everything we can to reach as many people as we can, I'm 100% sure that there are important historical materials being put in the garbage every day or left to languish in poor storage conditions. I am 100% sure of this. This is a crisis. We often refer to our archival collection as Baton Rouge's attic. The concept of a community ownership of cultural materials is vital, not only in terms of bringing in donations, but also helping foster the cultural identity of our area. Our threefold approach of education, outreach, and access is designed not only to raise the public's awareness of the importance of archives, it functions as a method of preservation. Ensuring cultural materials in private collections are not lost to time. Building bridges between the public and collecting institutions takes time, and we may never know the full extent of, uh, to which our efforts are successful. In conclusion, many small collections are at risk of being lost or destroyed. Public knowledge of the importance of archives is vital to their survival. Education aids in informing collectors of the intrinsic value of the materials and can offer guidance to long-term care. Outreach raises the awareness of what archives are and how they function, and access is vital in creating a connection to the historical record and gives context to our collective memory and cultural identity. Providing a program that incorporates these three aspects can help mitigate the loss of important archival materials. By actively working to change the perception that when people donate their materials to an archive, they become in inaccessible, we hope to create an environment in which these materials will be preserved for future and change the public perception that materials are boxed up and never to be seen again. Robert Penn Warren once said, history cannot give us a program for the future, but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and our common humanity so that we can better face the future. If we as a community can work to promote, educate, and provide access to archival materials, we will serve to protect them not only for today, but for the future as well. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I know, I always need a runner. <laughs> Thank you. I kind of feel important. Um, for your genealogy series at the parish, at the East Baton Rouge Parish Library, how often do you have that class that is 10 parts? 10 uh, class? I think to date we have about 15 classes and we teach them on a rotating basis. Okay. You can find all of our classes on our info guides. If you go to the library's homepage, we actually have a little genealogy portal right at the bottom mm -hmm. that will bring you directly to all of that information. 
We teach a wide variety of classes just on basic uh, genealogical research concepts, mm -hmm. all the way down to specialized uh, topics like adoption, um, African-American ancestry, and our newest class focuses on DNA and parsing out information that you learned from your DNA test. Last year, we bought a bunch of DNA kits and did testing oh, wow. on the staff so much fun. and uh, you know, tried to look at the difference between mitochondrial and the other types of DNA tests. We also deal with the uh, political and legal implications of, of doing DNA tests. Are, are they free? Yes, they're free. Oh, great. They're free. Oh, sorry, second question. For the scanner, how often um, do you have to make an appointment ahead of time to utilize yes, the scanner? Yes, you do need to make an appointment ahead of time. Our scan days are really the here kitty, you know, like, look, we have this cool toy, come play with it. <laughs> but um, anytime the library is open, and we're open 80 hours a week, seven, you know, seven days a week. Okay. So anytime you want to come in, just call and make an appointment. That way we make sure we have a staff member who knows how to use that. Sometimes on nights and weekends, we're staffed by Moonlighters and part-time mm -hmm. uh, staff members. But I, th I think I've got everybody knowing how to use everything now, so, so you're pretty safe coming anytime. But definitely call and make sure because we do have people, as I said, coming more and more to use, use the scanner. Of course, thank you. Um, if possible, could you tell us how much Fred was? $6,000. Again, you know, and we are, we are very lucky to have the funding that we do, and we're also very lucky to have the community support that we do. I very rarely have to buy anything. Mm -hmm. we, we are really lucky to have, you know, and also the work that we do with other collecting institutions in town. Hill does not want the Baton Rouge Garden Club scrapbook collection. They're going to tell those women to come over to me. And these women are happy because, you know, you can access our collection. We're right next to the botanical gardens. It's, you know, there are definitely tiers of collections in Baton Rouge. Of course, Hill is the lower Mississippi Valley collection, and they go far and wide. And if I have materials that I, I feel I can't handle, for example, somebody donated an 1830s map of Louisiana that I was just like, nope, <laughs> send it to Hill. You know, so we really do have a good working relationship in Baton Rouge with our collecting institutions. So that's where my budget goes, is to technology. Cool, I have a second question. So I'm the collections manager at Vermilionville Living History Museum here in Lafayette. Love it, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thanks. And one of the things that I, I realized we really needed when I got in was when we have to turn something away, um, creating a list of other institutions that could possibly take that. So yeah. I guess what I want to know is, I, I know you guys mentioned that you take in sometimes memorabilia and, and objects, but um, what does that list kind of look like? And do you reach out to other institutions to see what they are looking for? 100%, 100%, the list is in my head <laughs> um, but we do we send stuff all over the state uh, we, we got a donation of a bunch of yearbooks and so I've been calling parishes and sending yearbooks all over the state uh, we received the uh, photograph collection from our local newspaper and a large amount of that content was promotional materials for music groups so we pulled out all of the rock and roll content, boxed it up, and sent it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. I am happy to find homes for anything. If you ever need uh, recommendations on where to send stuff, take my card, and I'll be happy to help you out. But we, we are constantly doing that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wait, for you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so for your pamphlets and things like that, what do you, where do you send that stuff out? How do you get that out into the community? Uh, well, I'll walk down the street and hand it to you if I have to, but um, we have 14 branches. They live at each branch. Anytime we do any kind of outreach, we hand them out. Uh, 
They're just, they're just around along with the rest of our materials. They live on our info guide. Uh, we have stacks of them throughout the parish. <laughs> I have one employee that brings them to her doctor's offices. She brings her mama around to all these doctors and she'll just leave stacks of our information around, which uh, every day in every way, however we can get the information out there. If you can't afford a Fred or, um, you know, if you can't get a lot of Gaylord archival boxes and that sort of thing, is it okay to put stuff in plastic? No. <laughs> I, I can show you pictures. I can show you on the Hall of Horrors. I, it depends on the type of plastic. These plastics need to be PVC based. Mm -hmm. So you can probably find stuff, but there are also a lot of different grants. If you're a small collecting institution, there are grants that you can write that'll give you, you know, maybe three, four thousand dollars to help you purchase uh, preservation materials. I think there's a great, or there used to be, I don't know what it's like in the current environment, but the National Park Service is a great place to look for those types of small institution grants. So look around. Also talk to your, your big money players in your towns or, you know, in your communities. Go to Exxon. Go to the plants. They have money to, you know, maybe their PR departments could help fund your work. But no, it's not good. It's better just to put it in paper, you know, rather than plastic. Um, when it comes to the, to the children learning about different things, how do you incorporate that with the students in school? Yeah, we, we do. We have, uh, there are a couple of Boy Scout troops in town that actually have badges that they need to come and do research in our uh, communities. We have tried to reach out to the, the, the eighth grade classes in Louisiana focus on Louisiana history and in the past we've made some softball and unsuccessful attempts uh, to um, engage those communities but we do teach a class on for young researchers as part of our curriculum we don't offer it that much because we haven't had a lot of buy-in I mean you know we try I'm hoping that with our dig digital preservation efforts on the cr increase that we're going to see more and more young people come and we really do gear those types of classes towards young people. And we do have a lot of young researchers come in. Um, I think that again with the increase in awareness of our collection just being there, uh, teachers are now starting to send students to our collections to do research. Uh, and I should also just briefly note, three weeks from today, we have a grant writing session, but it's going to focus not on like big NEH grants, but these kind of small, small local ones, as well as ways to approach local businesses and, and people if you need those few thousand dollars. Yeah. So I think that's May 3rd. So I have a question. Um, so, or I guess I have two. Well, one is you're doing so much programming, and I was wondering what your staff is like, um, how you're able to carry out all the programming. And then the second question is about uh, the exhibits. So I'm really curious about uh, library exhibits and how well, if exhibits do a really good job of encouraging people to not just donate, but research. Like if that, if exhibits have been successful at guiding people to carry out research and expanding the types of items know. they think of including. I don't know, I don't have any metrics on that. You know, that may be something that people keep to themselves. Um, as far as donations, yes, they have definitely encouraged people to donate. You know, you always put out the sexiest stuff, the bright, the bright colors, the thing, you know, I don't know if in Lafayette, we y'all have anything comparable, but in uh, Baton Rouge, there was a, a department store that had this mascot that they would pull out every Christmas named Mr. Bingle. And he was this cute little snowman. And y'all, I spent 300, this is probably the most money I've ever spent on an eBay item. There was a Mr. Bingle. I spent that every Christmas. People are literally bringing their kids to come see Mr. Bingle. So our, our exhibits really do engender a very emotional response in people because these are materials that again have disappeared into private collections or get, 
you know, thrown in the garbage or get disseminated into thrift stores. And if you don't go to these places, you're never going to see them again. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Anything else? So out of all the things that you found like interesting, what's the most thing, like the thing that you found the most interesting to you? Like on a, I guess on a local level and then on a national level. That's a Sophie's choice question. You know, I get that question a lot. It's like, you know, every crow thinks hers is the blackest, I think is how the saying goes. So it's, you know, is it the Mardi Gras costumes? It, it might be, so we have a great collection of um, the gay men's Mardi Gras in Baton Rouge, the, the crew of Apollo, I know they're active here in Lafayette as well. Uh, Larry Fremen, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, donated his personal collection, and one of the costumes was this Pierre Cardin tuxedo. Uh, it was initially white, tails, you know, very 80s cut, but it was airbrushed to look like feathers. Fantastic, fantastic piece of costuming work. Um, I love Larry, he was a dear friend of mine, so I have that affinity for that costume. But, you know, golly, I love the weird little shot glasses from the old <laughs> bars that closed down, or, you know, the, the we have, there was, apparently Woody Dumas was, uh, quite a person and there are some very interesting letters that his uh, secretary of 30 years left in a in a unlabeled file in his collection that are very interesting to go through they're only half the correspondence so you get part of the picture but you know i was alone with this collection for from 2008 to 2014 so i know it very intimately and trying to pick one thing i couldn't do it they're all my little babies But you can see a lot of the great stuff on our digital archive. We've got a lot of really fun content on there. Anything else? OK, well, it looks like we're done. Thank awesome. me and uh, join me in thanking <laughs> our guest. Thank you for coming.